Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pete Stearns. I'm one of our pastors here, and, and I'm sure that, uh, that many of you are, are disappointed and discouraged, as I am, uh, that my dad isn't here with us this morning. In fact, there are probably some of you, and I apologize for this, that are finding out right now uh, that my dad is not with us this morning. Uh, on Thursday, he gave me a call, and, uh, and, and, and he was so bummed out, but he was feeling pretty sick, um, and, and he's kind of continued to feel sick over the course of the weekend, and, and, and so was wasn't able to do the travel and, and, and all of that stuff. He's recovering at home. He's doing well uh, today, but, but unfortunately wasn't able to join us. And so uh, we've, we've bumped his. He's still going to come. He's still going to join us. Our tentative plan is to have him uh, join us here in, in January. And so if you were excited to see him, don't worry. He is going to come and, and join us in just a few, uh, few months. But, but right after I got that phone call, I kind of entered into scramble mode, right? And you know, I'm, I'm kind of off and writing during the month of, of August. And I also play a little bit of golf during the month of August, if I'm honest. So I was at the course and, 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 and I apologize to, to, to my playing partners because I suddenly became uh, very not fun to be with as I was trying to figure out what was uh, supposed to happen next. And so I called uh, our worship director, Chris Yingle, and I said, hey, I, I don't know what we should do this Sunday. My dad can't make it. And, and, and Chris paused for a minute. And he said, well, wasn't your dad just going to share his story? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't you just share your story, right? It seemed like a simple enough solution, but it made me a little uncomfortable. If I'm honest, I've never shared my story in a large adult context. I've shared it in student ministry. I've shared it with, with individuals, but, but it felt somewhat self-indulgent and self-important. And so I kind of pushed back a little bit and, and he reminded me that my story isn't my own. My story is, is God's story. And the power of testimony is that we have an opportunity to hear how the gospel is, is moving in, in, in the context of our lives. And, and so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share a, a few significant moments in my life. I'm going to preach through it a little bit uh, here and, and, and share some, some passages that I've been reflecting on in, in just the past few months here as well. But, but my story is heavily influenced by, by the faith story of my parents as well. And so I want to start by, by talking a little bit about how my mom and dad uh, came to profess a belief in, in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, you see, my mom was uh, in late high school. She was a, a, a junior in high school. Her family didn't have a, 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 a real serious faith. Maybe they went to, to church on Easter and Christmas, but, but it certainly wasn't a foundational piece of, of her life. And she would have uh, said that she was not a believer at the time, perhaps maybe an agnostic. And one of her friends invited her to one of these uh, Southern California Jesus Revolution Crusade events. And, and at that event, uh, God stirred in her in a powerful way, and she gave her life to Jesus. And so for the next few years, she was on fire for her faith. And, and so a year and a half later, uh, she headed across the country from Southern California to upstate New York to, to, to go to college at, at Cornell University. And when she arrived on campus, it was her mission to make sure that every person on that campus had heard the gospel message. So much so that a group of her friends thought it would be funny to set her up on a blind date with, with a man who was known to be one of the most devout atheists on campus. He had this, this reputation of, of really being averse to any religion in any sort of form. This man, of course, later became my father. Uh, and, and so they went on this blind date, and, and my mom, almost immediately after seeing uh, th this gentleman, he was a few years older than her, he was a senior, and, and, and she realized that a joke had been played. Uh, and so instead of leaving, uh, she took on very much a, a persona of, of the Apostle Paul, right, who, who, who reveled in the fact that he was chained to a jail guard because it gave an opportunity to share the gospel message. And she thought, well, he's stuck with me here for dinner, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share about my faith. And so she pulled out her Bible, and she pulled out the four spiritual laws, and she began to preach at my dad. And my dad sat there quietly and nodded along because he thought she was quite pretty. And, uh, and he figured as long as he kept his mouth shut, maybe they'd have a second date. And, and sure enough, they did. And so they dated over the course of that year, but, but constantly were, were butting heads about faith. You see, they had these worldviews that were dynamically different. And so when my dad graduated from college that year, they made the hard decision uh, to break up and go their separate ways. 
Uh, when my dad moved down to Pennsylvania and he was at, at graduate school there and, and one night in his dorm room, he stumbled across a radio program uh, by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity. And he found himself drawn into this, this compelling message of a God who loves him, a, a message that was articulated in, in, a, in a logical and formulaic approach that, that he appreciated as, as, as kind of this, this big thinker. And so after he heard that, he started to explore further. And, and he, he grabbed any resource that he could put his hands on that, that, that articulated the reality of Faith and, and after months of researching and exploring, he too found the need for a savior and surrendered his life to God. Sometime later, my, my parents found their way back together and, and the rest is history, as, as they say. But it's important because the way that their faith lives came to fruition deeply impacted my own. You see, my siblings and I uh, pretty clearly grew up in a devout Christian home. Our, our parents were committed to, to all of the church things, right? They were Sunday school teachers. They were in a small group. Any missions weekend, we were a part of it. We hosted missionaries. We went on all of the VBSs. We did all of the right things. I was quick with my sword drills. I had studied my scripture uh, back and forth. I knew all of the different stories. I had memorized the key verses to get the stickers on my chart and get the lollipop at, at the end of the week. And, and, and not only that, but my siblings and I went to a, a Christian school as well. And in fact, when I think over my childhood, there is only one Sunday in my entire upbringing that I didn't go to church. And, and it wasn't because of something fun. It, instead, it was because I was in the emergency room because I had been clinging so tightly to my bed, trying not to go to church that when my dad let go, I smacked my head against the frame and had to get stitches. It worked, but not exactly the way that I was, I was hoping. And, and, and like any uh, child that was growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, much of my faith was rooted in, in a very familiar passage to us. That passage is John 3, 16 through 18. I probably don't need to read it, but, but I'm going to. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. You see, I, I, I wanna pause for a minute and say that this is one of the most profound statements of, of love that has ever been recorded. That, that God so deeply loved us, his creation, that he sent his one and only son so that we might be restored in fullness as his children. That a God that did not have to bore the cross to carry the, the penalty of our sins and was resurrected from the grave. And I don't want us to miss the impact and the formation of this passage but I also want us to recognize that this passage is, is, is really oriented towards eternity. And eternity is a difficult concept to understand as an adult, let alone as a child. You see, the scriptural foundation of my faith as a child was that one day I would die. And when that time came, if I had been in a relationship with Jesus... I would be spared eternal condemnation and instead would have a ticket punched to heaven to experience the fullness of life in eternity. And it brought about this feeling that, that everything that we did in our day to day was all putting in the work for a reward that would come in the distant future. From the point of, uh, of learning about this passage when I was four or five years old and until eternity, I would work to maintain a relationship with God so that I would be spared condemnation. And so I found myself understanding the, the life of faith as, as a restrictive one. 
a faith that was filled with, with rules and regulations, a, a faith that was filled with boxes that needed to be checked, with behaviors that needed to be participated in. And when you blend that kind of thinking with my parents' spiritual background, you can begin to understand the difficulty that I had in my youth in really leaning into my faith. You see, my parents had not come to faith until later in their life. And, and, and I thought that faith was all about an end game play on eternity. And so I began to recognize that I could live my life now, and then at some point in the future, I could take faith more seriously. That, that, that I could do all of the things that the world told me would bring me happiness, all the things that the world told me would be fun, all the things that culture told me high school boys should be participating in. And then years down the road, when I was starting to take my life seriously, when I was gonna start a family, then and only then, I could enter into this kind of restrictive way of living in order to secure for myself eternity in heaven. And so that's exactly what I did. In middle school, I, I walked away from my faith, convinced that if this was real, if this was going to have an impact, I could worry about it later because I was gonna be too busy having fun in my youth. And so I did everything that, that the world told me would, would bring me happiness. I did everything that the world told me would bring me fullness. I lived a life that was oriented around myself and myself alone. And I found myself hanging out with the wrong people in the wrong places I found myself entering into relationships that were, were shallow. Relationships that, that, that I was manipulating and using for my own personal glory. I found myself pursuing significance in all of the wrong places. I found myself angry and bitter. I found myself buying into this, this, this ideology that I needed to be this, this tough guy, this, this untouchable. And yet it didn't bring me any of the happiness or the fullness that I had been promised. Instead, my, my relationships felt trivial. I felt empty. I felt depressed. I felt afraid. My relationship with my parents and my family was, was fractured and broken. And so I remember late in my junior year coming to this conclusion that, that something had to give. And so when a few of, of my friends from my soccer team invited me to go on a missions trip to Mexico with their youth group, I said yes. Because I thought to myself, well, that seems like an easy way to take a trip to Mexico with your friends without your parents coming along with you. Uh, that, was, that was the first motivation. Uh, uh, the second was that uh, I was pretty driven and wanted to be successful in life, and, and I figured this wouldn't hurt my college application process. And, and the third is I had this glimmer of hope that maybe serving others might give me the fullness that I was longing for. It, it, it might fill me up and, it, it, in a way that, that, that gave me some semblance of happiness and joy. And so I went on that trip. I was uh, just about to turn 18 at the time. Uh, and that trip became a turning point in my faith, but, but not for the reasons that you might expect. It was something like the third night of the missions trip, and we were all in the dining hall having dinner. And the youth pastor came in and tapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I could talk to him in the hallway. And let me tell you, in this season of my life, uh, talking with authority figures in the hallway was a pretty familiar experience for me, okay? I, I was used to being called out and, and, and disciplined for something that I had done, and, and so I, I, I kind of uh, hung my head in shame, and I was racking my brain. I was like, I've been pretty good this trip. I can't imagine what I'm about to get in trouble for. And I went out into the hallway, and he looked at me, and he said, 
He said, Pete, I don't, I don't know how to say this, uh, but we got a message from your parents that your older sister, Hannah, who's three years older than me, who was a, a role model for me, who went to the college that I dreamed of, of, of going to, uh, that she's been in a terrible accident. Uh, she was crossing the road and, and a car ran a red light and ran her over. And, and right now she's in critical condition in the ER. Her body is riddled with broken bones and, and internal bleeding and, and they don't know if she's gonna make it. And he said, they said, if she does make it, they're just not sure what, what her quality of life is going to be. And I remember just feeling this gut punch. Uh, immediately I was, I was overwhelmed and I was, I was sick to my stomach and, and, and I didn't know what to do. I had this tough guy facade. And so, so all I said was, was can, can I go up to my room for the rest of the night? Can I, can I skip out on the lesson and worship? And and he, of course, said, yeah, yeah, take whatever space you need. So I walked up and got into the dorm room, and I just fell to the ground and just began to weep uncontrollably. I became, I, I, I was weeping because I was so afraid. I was afraid for my sister's life. My sister, who was, who was one of my closest friends, my sister, who was a model for what I wanted to be, but I was also afraid for my own life. Because my entire worldview, my entire foundation was built upon this assumption that one day in the future, I would take my faith seriously. And suddenly that future didn't seem all that certain. And so for the first time in years, I began to pray. I begged God to save my sister. I, I, I begged God to, 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 to bring her out of that hospital room. I, I made all sorts of promises and bargains and deals. I, I wrote checks that I certainly could not cash with God that night. And, and, and I begged God to bring my sister through it. About an hour later, my youth pastor, Matt, came in. And he sat down with me on the floor. And I said, Matt, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. Would you help me do that? And we sat there on the floor in a dorm room that smelled terrible in the middle of Mexico. And we prayed together. And I surrendered my life to Jesus that night. And it didn't make everything better. It didn't fix everything, but, but suddenly I, I felt this weight that was lifted from me, a weight that I had been carrying for years. Suddenly for the first time in, in, in five years, I felt a sense of, of peace and hope. And I was able to sleep that night. The next morning I woke up and, and Matt came in and he said, hey, uh, we found a satellite phone. And so we're gonna be able to call, uh, call your family right? Because this was before the day and age of cell phones that could make international calls and all that. And so it took a while to, to be able to figure out how I could communicate and see how my sister was doing. And, and, and so I called my parents and I was surprised when my sister picked up the phone. She said, hey, Pete, how are you? And I paused for a minute and I looked around for the hidden camera thinking I was on some like form of scared straight. Uh, and, 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 and I said, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? And she said, you won't believe what just happened. She said, the doctors just ordered a second set of MRIs and I don't have a broken bone in my body. There's no internal bleeding. Yeah, praise God. And I'm walking out of here less than 24 hours after this horrific accident without so much as a scratch on my body. And she said, the doctors can't explain it. They've been talking about something called rapid bone fusion, but they said the quickest they've ever seen that happen was, was multiple weeks. And, and here I am hours later, walking out of the hospital untouched. And the doctors can explain it however they would like to, but, but I imagine that you and I recognize that this is a miracle. And it's a miracle that completely changed the trajectory of my life. 
It's a miracle that completely set me on a new path, that, that, that changed what was important for me, that affirmed everything that I had prayed the night before. And so in that moment, I rejoiced and said, God, my life is yours. But I didn't really know what that looked like. Right, because at that point, all I thought was, was that giving God my life meant following all of these rules. Making sure I was the, the good kid at, at school. Making sure that I didn't do anything on the weekends that I would regret. And, and, and so I, I went to my youth pastor and I, I asked him if he would mentor me. And it was one of the most formative decisions I've ever made in my life. Because every week we would get lunch together and we would talk. In fact, when I was back in Seattle just a few weeks ago, I met with him twice in, in that week that I was home. And he began to invite me into a different way of understanding a walk with Jesus. A way that wasn't particularly concerned with eternity, but instead a, a way that brought me into life now. I discovered this passage in Colossians chapter 2, which continues on uh, into, into chapter 3, it says this, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humidity, humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You see, I had resisted a journey with God because I was afraid it would be restrictive. I was afraid that it would keep me from the fun and the fullness and the happiness that the world had promised me. And yet I realized in that season of my life that a journey with Jesus is anything but restrictive. And I entered into this powerful season of freedom. Freedom from the brokenness of this world. World Freedom from, from the expectations of happiness that, that I had placed on myself. Freedom from having it all figured out. And suddenly my heart and my mind were tuned to things above. And in that connection, for the first time, I felt a deep sense of belonging. I remember a group of friends or a group of, of students at my school that I had been really unkind to, that I had bullied for most of high school because I, I thought their faith was silly and trivial, welcomed me in as one of their own. And those relationships became some of the most impactful relationships of my life. And in fact, one of those students came and preached here last year, Alex Cotto. I, I, I found my relationship with my parents repaired as I put in the work to, to earn their trust back. I distanced myself from, from those things that offered me false promises of, of hope and happiness. And, and in doing so, I found purpose. I found identity. And I think that's the first lesson that I hope we can learn from this story is the reality that a relationship with Jesus is about producing the fullness of life, not avoiding death. I imagine many of us are sitting here today in a similar posture that, that I held, 
a posture that says, once I reach this point in my life, once I reach this point in my career, once I reach this point in my bank account, once I have that home or that car, then I'm gonna start taking faith seriously. We understand a relationship with Jesus as a spiritual retirement plan. Once we've figured out everything, once we've checked all the boxes that the world has told us, then we're gonna start leaning into eternity. And and what I wanna challenge us to recognize is that in doing so, we are so missing out on the fullness of the identity and purpose that we were created specifically to bear. The identity as children of God. And when we are able to surrender our life and not just our death, To Christ, we experience a fullness, a wholeness that we could not possibly imagine, a wholeness that we can't even explain. And so if that's you today, I wanna encourage you to ask yourself the question, what does it look like to surrender? What does it look like to surrender this morning and tomorrow and for the week after? Because when you do, you'll experience a connection with your creator that allows you to understand who you were made to be. I'll be honest, I I hesitate to share this miraculous story. Like I said, this is the first time I've shared it in in, in an adult context here at at a larger scale. And, And I hesitate for two reasons. The first reason is that not everyone gets a miracle. Not everyone will receive a miracle in their life, at least not in the manner that I did. I consider myself so privileged, so blessed to have received that affirmation of God's presence to me in that moment. But if I'm honest, I can't tell you why it happened. Because I know a lot of people that are far more faithful than I that have prayed for a miracle for years and the miracles never come. I know people that have suffered with the atrocities of cancer for years and they have prayed day in and day out that God would free their body from this sickness and yet he never does. I know couples desperate to have a child that pray all throughout the day that God would bless them with a baby that never comes. I myself have prayed countless times for miracles that didn't show up the way that I expected them to. In fact, I remember five years ago, there was a young student in our community who had a similar experience to my sister. She was crossing the street, a drunk driver ran a red light and hit her. And I remember gathering that night in the student center with 150 students and we prayed throughout the night for a miracle. And I remember feeling so confident it would come because it had happened before. And yet the next morning she passed away. And I'll be honest, I don't know how to explain that as a pastor. I don't have an answer for you of why God sometimes intervenes with a miracle and sometimes he doesn't. But one thing I'm confident in is that the miracle is never about the miracle itself. The miracle is never about the healing. The miracle is never about the provision. The miracle is never about the the protection. Instead, it's always about the kingdom of God. It's always about the gospel message. And we see that over and over and over again in scripture. When Jesus heals the blind man, it's not about physical sight, it's about spiritual sight for all of us. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, it's not about a quick meal so that he can keep preaching. It's about the bread of life that each of us are starving for. When throughout the the, the early church, the apostles perform miracles and healing, it's, it's not because healthcare isn't affordable. It's because it's an opportunity to see the work of God in a way that builds his church and multiplies his church. What a catalytic effect. And so in the same way, when, when we have the opportunity, the privilege to experience a miracle, it's always about bringing glory to God. And I can say certainly that that has been the case 
for me and the story with my sister. I have seen people's lives changed, mine included because of what God did with her, but, but I'm also certain that it served kingdom purposes that I can't even see right now. Miracles from God are outside of our control. And yet they always bring God glory. The second hesitation that I have is that stories of miracles can often cause skeptics to doubt even further. When I've shared this story in, in, in one-on-one settings, there are basically two universal responses. The first is people are amazed and encouraged, much like I was, but, but the second fairly frequent response is doubt. The belief that at best, I'm misremembering some details. And at worst, I'm actively manipulating people. And you see, I understand that doubt. Because I suffer with that same doubt myself. I've heard so many people say, if I had a miracle in my life, then I wouldn't doubt. And let me tell you, that's not true. Because for 15 years... After this happened with my sister, I never talked to her about it. I never sat down with her to, to wrestle through the details. I, I never picked up the phone and, 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 and chatted with her about her experience there. Why? Because I was terrified. I was terrified that if I called my sister, she would tell me that I was remembering it incorrectly. If I called my sister, she would say I had, I had the facts and the details of, of, of the event all mixed up. And, and if she said that, then my faith would be fractured and it would crumble. And so I'd rather not make that phone call. I'd rather live believing that this had happened than risk the chance that it had not. So five years ago was the first time that I called her to talk about it. I finally got up this courage. I finally got up this confidence. And, 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 and I, I called my sister and we chatted for about three hours on the phone. And it was one of the most joy-filled conversations I've ever had with a family member. We laughed together. We, we wept together. And she confirmed every single detail that I had remembered. She gave me all the support, the evidence that I needed to, to recognize truly that this had been a miracle. But, but she also said something that brought tears to my eyes, a shiver down my spine. It, it, it made the hair on my skin stand up. It was a detail I had never heard before. She said, you know what the craziest thing was? After the accident, there was a, a bystander, a good Samaritan that was, was standing there and, 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 and picked up a, a lot of my personal belongings from the ground. Uh, she had been hit so hard that she, she lost certain articles of clothing, shoes, purse, scarf, those kind of things. And, and, and so this good Samaritan picked up these items from the road and, and, and got in his car and, and, and followed the ambulance to the hospital, waited patiently for her to be admitted and, and then went back to the doctors and handed them all of her personal effects and, and then asked what happened to the guy that was with her. And they said, they said there, was no one, there was no one else brought to the hospital with her. And he said, he said no, what happened to the guy that was, was dressed in all white that hugged her just before the car hit her? You see, my sister had been alone that night. And yet God was with her. God had protected her in that moment. And because of my doubt, because of my fear, it took me 15 years to hear possibly the most formative detail of the story. And I think that's my second challenge for us today. So many of us walk through life, walk through faith riddled with doubts, Riddled with questions, riddled with concerns. And it might not be about miracles. It could, could be about any number of other things. 
It could be about, about how a good God lets bad things happen. It could be about how science and, and, and creation interact. There are all sorts of these doubts that spiral within us. And for whatever reason, we think the best response is to ignore them. We think the best response is just to force them down. But slowly over time, those doubts that have been forced down begin to erode the foundation of our faith. And yet any time I have brought my doubts and my questions and my insecurities to God, his truth has prevailed. And so right now, if you're wrestling with questions, if you're wrestling with doubt, don't ignore them. It doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian. It doesn't mean that everything in your life is going to fall apart. If you're wrestling with those doubts, Confide in someone else. Talk to one of those members of a small group like Jarm was talking about. Come, come and chat with, with one of our team members here at the church. Share with them what you're wrestling with. And I promise you, God's truth will prevail. And you will feel that burden of doubt and skepticism lifted from your spirit. Now I'm going to skip over some pretty big portions of, of my faith trajectory after that for the sake of, of, of time. I'm already probably gonna run long as it is. Uh, and, and, and so we're gonna miss out on, on some of the most formative relationships in my life. My, my marriage to my wife, Brittany, the, the privilege I had to be the father of my three boys, Shepherd, Archer, and, and Finley. But I figured as I was preparing this is that, that you guys have received a decent number of, of stories about, about Brittany and the boys. And, and you probably will continue to hear a decent number of stories about Brittany and the boys here. Uh, but, but I want to talk about uh, how I've seen God's fingerprints on, on the trajectory of my life uh, since I made that decision. Uh, you see, uh, shortly, after, um, shortly after entering into this mentorship with Matt, I, I found myself compelled to go uh, and, and become a pastor. I wanted to, to follow the model he had set for me. And so I went to Wheaton College and I got a degree in, in Christian education and theology and, and got plugged in with, uh, with a church in the area, Christ Church. I served as their middle school pastor. And, and, and I remember at that point in my life, I didn't really understand how to blend my faith and ministry identity with, with my career aspirations. Right? I, I had not had a, a, a model of, of, of a parent who had been a pastor before. And, and for the bulk of, of my growing up, I had distanced myself from the church. And so I found myself without really knowing what this was going to look like for me. And so all I did was, was blended my American dream, my desire for, for success and, and notoriety and, and fame, the, the desire to climb the ladder, to go to the next bigger and better thing with ministry. And so I remember starting at Christ Church and having conversations like, I'm fortunate to be in a position like this, to start at a church like this that's going to give me opportunities, that's going to afford me a chance to grow and, and, and head out equipped into the next best thing. And, and sure enough, in those first few years at Christ Church, I, I benefited greatly from mentorships and coaching of other pastors there, but I was always thinking to myself, what's next? What, what's the step that's going to lead me to, to more notoriety? What's the step that's going to lead me to more significance? What's the step that's going to lead me to, to more personal fullness? And sure enough, after, after three or four years at Christ Church, I received uh, an email from a pastor that I deeply admired. He was the pastor of probably one of the, the, the five most influential churches in the country. And, and, and the email uh, invited me uh, to come and be a candidate uh, for a, a student ministry position that was open in his church. And, and I got this email and I thought this, this is what I've been waiting for. This is the platform that's gonna give me the opportunity to have a greater influence, a, 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 a greater significance. This is, this is the opportunity that's gonna let me write books and do all sorts of things like, like that. And so I eagerly headed down for the interview. And the interview went, went pretty well. It was a few hours long, and, and, and I was just so excited about this opportunity. And so I went home, and, and I was sharing with Brittany, and, and, and I was uh, kind of really selling this to her because it was going to mean a cross-country move and, and all sorts of things. And, and I just said, Britt, I think this is what God wants for us. I think this is what God has been preparing us for all along. 
And, and, and I eagerly and excitedly shared to her this, this beautiful story about how God had woven this together. I, I fit all of these obscure details in so that this looked like this perfect path. And she paused for a minute and she said, Pete, I think you're confusing your pride with God's will. She said, I, I think you just want this job because of how it's gonna make you look. And I can't imagine that that's how God's plan for your life works. And again, it was this gut punch. It was this gut punch, this, this, this sobering reality because she was right. And so the next morning, I, I removed my candidacy. And instead of feeling disappointed, I felt alive. Alive in recognizing that God had specifically put us in this community at Christ Church to build his kingdom. And it ushered in this kind of seven-year period of time of, of, of just this fullness of life. There was, there was flourishing ministry. It was growing. We, we, we had relationships around us that, that were meaningful and, and, and lifted us up, that prepared us to be, to be young parents. I received incredible mentorship and coaching from a number of pastors that I so deeply respect. And I felt so in touch with what God had created me to do. But at the end of those seven years, I, I started to feel this stirring in my spirit, this feeling that there was something else out there for us. And, and at first, I tried to suppress that feeling because I really loved Christ Church. I loved where we were. I loved the ministries that we are a part of. And, and, and also, I felt pretty safe there. I was pretty comfortable. I, I knew what I was, was doing. I was familiar with the rhythms and the people that were there. And, and so for the most part, I was able to show up to work and, and go through the motions and, and, and punch the clock. And, and things were good. And so I kept resisting this kind of holy discomfort in me and, until it grew to be too much. And a couple of years later, COVID hit and, 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 and Brittany and I were starting to think about, okay, what, what does it mean to make a change? What does it mean to kind of blow up our life here? And we came to the conclusion, well, well it wouldn't be that bad of a change if we went to a place that was familiar. And, and so I thought I found this perfect solution to what God was doing in me with also the desire for safety and comfort and familiarity. And, and so we began applying for jobs in Minnesota near Brittany's family. It was a city that we loved. We were surrounded by aunts and uncles and, and, and brothers and sisters and grandma and grandpa. It was, it was kind of this perfect solution. And, and sure enough, I started interviewing with, with a church that was just outside of Minneapolis. And again, as I started to interview, I, I thought to myself, this is exactly what God has been preparing us for. This is the perfect fit. The, the church checked all the boxes. There was tons of familiarity to, to the church that I had been serving at. It was in the, the specific neighborhood that Brittany and I had designated as wanting to live in. It was a neighborhood that was close to her family, but not too close to her family, if you know what I mean. And, 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 and so we were just certain, the whole process, this is where God's leading us. It's clear, it's obvious, it's evident. And so we poured our hearts and souls into this process. And the process took nine months because it happened during COVID. It was remarkably emotionally exhausting. And by the end of it, I was one of the final two candidates and I was so certain that God was leading me there. And so you can imagine my shock and disappointment when I got the call from the head of the search committee saying they were going in a different direction. Suddenly, all of our aspirations to the future, all of our hopes felt like they were ripped out from under us. So I went back to work to go through the motions, to punch the clock, resigned to the reality that, well, I guess I've, I've misread this. Misread this feeling. I've, I've misread what God's doing, and maybe I just need to lean in for another season here at Christ Church. About a year later, I got a phone call from the same recruiter that I had worked with over those nine months. He was a recruiter that I had gotten to know fairly well, right? It was pretty unique to, to, to be spread out that long of a period. And so we talked, you know, once or twice a week, every single week uh, during those nine months. And, and he called and he said, Pete, I, I, I know you pretty well. Would you admit that? And I said, yeah, of course. And he said, he said well, I'm going to need you to trust me here. 
because I found a church that I just think is the perfect fit for you and your family. It aligns with, with, with every single uh, thing that, 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 that you have talked about being passionate about. And I promise you, this is going to be the right fit for you. It's gonna bring so much life. It's, it, it's gonna be great. Uh, and, and it's in North Carolina. And I, I stopped for a minute and I said, hey, Jay, I don't know if you know this, but North Carolina is a lot farther from Minneapolis than Chicago is. Uh, and, and so ultimately I said, I'm, I'm not interested. It didn't check any of the boxes of being safe, of, of being comfortable. In the back of my head, I thought, if I go and take a job at, in Minneapolis and I flame out, at least, at least my family will have my in-laws right there to, to help us and, and support us. If we go to North Carolina, there's, there's no safety net. And so I felt pretty confident in that decision to, to turn down the recruiter. Four months passed without me thinking about it again. But for whatever reason, four months later, four months after that phone call, I was, I was sitting in my quiet times that morning and I just felt this heavy weight of regret and shame. Realizing that, that I was only willing to follow God on my terms. That I was only willing to take a leap of faith if it wasn't really a leap in the first place. And so that morning, I prayed and I said, God, whatever comes next, I'll explore it. And I kid you not, an hour later, I received an email from that same recruiter. And the email said this, let me read. Hi, Peter. Just wanted to circle back to you about St. Mark's Community Church in Burlington, North Carolina. They're talking to a couple of candidates that they like, but I can't get the thought out of my mind that this might be a great spot for you. Let me know if you're interested in having a conversation. And we all know how it played out from there, <laughs> right? Here I am, Burlington, North Carolina, unexpected, and yet it has been this beautiful season of our life that we could not have possibly imagined if we had done it our way. God so clearly was preparing us and setting us up for something that we could not have possibly anticipated, something that we did not plan for, something that we resisted at first. And I am so grateful that he did that. Because there have been so many moments in my time here where I have this imposter syndrome, where, where I'm faced with, with difficult problems that, that I don't have the answers to. And, and if I was doing that in a place that I had worked so hard to put my foot in the door, to force myself into, I would find myself burning out spiritually, believing that, that I had gotten myself there. And so it was my job to get myself through the challenges. And yet, while we're here and we face those challenges, there's such peace because I know God was faithful bringing us here. And so God's been gonna be faithful again. And he's shown himself to be faithful over and over and over again. And we have fallen deeply in love with this church and this community. I think sometimes those moments of disappointment, those moments of grief, where God doesn't answer our prayer the way that we wanted God to answer our prayer, are setting up something that we can't even see yet. Something that's so much more beautiful, something that's so much more meaningful and impactful. I think during this season, I found myself wrestling with the question, how do I discern God's will for my life? If it's not just about my pride, if it's not just about uh, aligning things with, with my five-year plan, then, then how do I know what God is calling me to Next, it's, it's a conversation I've had a, with a lot of folks in, in, in our, our, our community that have come to me looking for, for, for wisdom and prayer. And let me tell you, I don't have a lot of wisdom, but we've got Phil Anderson on our staff, so you can chat with him. Uh, but I will pray for you, right? But there's, there's this kind of idea that, that, that if God has planned my whole life, what happens if I don't do the thing that he planned for me? What happens if I step through a door that I wasn't supposed to step through? 
Is God's going to suddenly look at my life and shake my head and think, oh man, you've turned so wrong. You're so lost in this moment. Am I really going to go into a season in which I just enter into this downward spiral? And the short answer is no. You see, I think the will of God for our lives is so much more simple than we've made it. And yet so much more challenging. I love what Colossians 3 says about this. So we continue to read in, in, in Paul's letter to the church of Colossae. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, the people living in God's will, the people that God has planned, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I want to pause there for a minute. We're going to go back to that passage, but, but let that sink in. What does Paul say is God's plan for the church of Colossae? For the Colossians. He says that they would be clothed in effect with the fruit of the Spirit. That they would live lives that are marked by the attributes of the God that dwells within them. And that being clothed in the fruit of the Spirit, they would be quick to forgive. Notice he says, if you have a grievance with someone else, not to ask them to apologize to you, but instead forgive them as you have been forgiven by your heavenly father. And with that forgiveness as the foundation, you are led to love unconditionally the way that God has loved you. What does it mean to follow after God's will for your life? To be marked by his spirit, to forgive, to love unconditionally. What would it look like if when we were making decisions about our life, about our purchases, about our politics, about how we engaged in our neighborhoods and church, we didn't ask which is the right thing to do, but instead we asked, can I demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in that home, in that job, in that community? Can I be quick to forgive? Can I be marked by love? Paul concludes saying, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts and whatever you do, whichever door you walk through, whatever job you have, Whatever role you play in your family or your community, whatever you purchase, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When we're faced with a decision, one of the first questions we should ask is, is how will my response affect my ability to live every moment of my life for God's glory. I mean, think about that first job that, that Brittany and I were considering. Brittany was right. It couldn't possibly be the Lord's will because I would have taken that job for my glory. And if I was working every day for my glory, how could I possibly be working every day for God's glory? Why was it the time for me to take a leap of faith when I was at Christ Church? Because I had grown apathetic. I showed up to punch the clock to go through the rhythms because it gave me comfort and safety. I had a job that allowed me to provide in a dependable fashion for my family. It was about security. And if it was about my personal security, how could it possibly be about the glory of God. If we had taken a job 
that checked all of our personal boxes, that, that, that led us into this, this safe community? How could I show up every morning committed to bringing God glory? Again, I think so often we complicate the will of God when we are called to surrender our life and not our death to our God, we do so with a commitment that in whatever we do, wherever we are, whatever we purchase, whatever we participate in, we do so marked by the Spirit of God, quick to forgive, abiding in love, and always for the glory of God. So I'm gonna invite our ushers to come down today for communion because we're gonna have a chance to, to come to the Lord's table. And, we take, and when we take of the bread and we take of the cup, we do so as a surrender to have our lives marked by just that, by the spirit of God that he freely pours into us through his body on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb. And in taking that cup and taking that bread, we commit ourselves to live every day of our life, every word and deed, all for the glory of God and not our own. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you are a God that laid down your life. Yes, to secure our eternity, but also to fill our empty cup. The life that we live today. And so Lord, as, as we take of your bread and we drink of your cup, may we be filled to all measure with your spirit in a way that explodes out of us as a chosen people of God, holy and dearly loved that we might be clothed in the gifts of your spirit, that we might be a people that is known for our forgiveness, marked by our love. And Lord, that we would surrender each day of our life fully to your glory and your kingdom. We pray this in your name. Amen.